Is it a story you'd want to read? That was my motto when I was in my 20s. I wanted to be that old woman in the corner in the rocking chair with all the stories. The one others would say, wow, did you hear what Charlotte did when she was young? So I studied business in Montreal. I went whitewater rafting. I crowd surfed when the strokes played at the Civic Hall. And I got a silver medal in a Kung Fu competition. The secret is there were only two of us in my category. <laughs> But I got the story, and storytelling is fundamental to us as humans. It's older than writing, and a good story helps us to process and share information in a way that creates an emotional connection. It bonds us together. And the elements of a great story are a main character meets an unexpected obstacle. A crisis results. They try to overcome the obstacle, which leads to the climax and then the outcome of the story. The stories I planned on telling were once full of adventure, but Enid Blyton style adventures where there might be a mild climax, but everything would be sorted out by tea time. I was in for a rude awakening. <laughs> My story is far from a mild crisis and not so easy to tell. So let's set the scene. When I turned 30, I was working in PR and I had burned out. I'd cry in my car on the way to work and I'd daydream about losing my job and jumping on the first flight out of the UK until I realized I didn't have to lose my job. I could just hand in my notice and book a trip. And that's what I did. One lunchtime in September 2013, I booked my flights to Bangkok and a Northern Thailand experience tour. And instantly I felt better. I was going to be free, but... In the weeks running up to the trip, and here's the unexpected obstacle, I started to feel different. I noticed a prominent blue vein in my arm and chest. I had a cough that wouldn't go away and my neck, lips and eyes were getting really puffy and bulky. So much so that one friend thought I had mumps, another just didn't recognize me. Several trips to doctors didn't find anything untoward either. I was given cough medicine an inhaler, a urine test, but I was told it was cough and cold season and there was a lot of it about. And besides, I really wanted to go on my trip. I didn't dream it was anything serious. So on the 8th of January 2014, I flew out to Thailand and for the next few weeks, I went to temples, waterfalls, I went to a cookery class. I had some good times, but... The symptoms weren't going away. And now for the crisis, the symptoms were getting worse and scary. Like the time in the cinema in Bangkok, when I had to reach into my throat to widen it so I could breathe more easily. Or the night in the hotel in Chiang Mai, when I was coughing so much, I didn't know if I'd wake up in the morning. But I didn't know what to do. I was thousands of miles away from home, alone. But then a lady in my tour group got a mild infection. She went to the hospital down the street and within 45 minutes was given antibiotics. It was so easy. Then I decided to go. Within two hours, I was hooked up to an IV drip with suspected pneumonia. Three days later, a CT scan showed a 10 centimeter tumor compressing my airways. It was non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, blood cancer. Six days later, I was flown back to the UK in a tiny air ambulance. Time was of the essence, and the following week, I started chemotherapy. 
If my life were a book, in this next part, I was overcoming the obstacle. So for the next five months, I was having chemo every three to four weeks. And the process was grueling. I lost my hair. With every cycle, I grew weaker. My white blood cell count was reduced to zero, so I couldn't fight infection without being in hospital. By the end of the treatment, the climax of the story, I was as brittle as bone china. But while it was a very dark and difficult time, it was straightforward. If I followed my treatment plan, there was an excellent chance that I would get better. And I did. So, for the outcome of the story. In August 2014, I had my final PET scan, which showed the tumour had gone. I was so happy, grateful, and relieved. I wanted to live life to the fullest. If my life had been a fairy tale, this could have been the happily ever after moment. But real life isn't like that. The end of my story was not tied up in a neat conclusion. The hospital had been a kind sanctuary. It was one of the few places where I looked and felt normal. The hospital appointments had given my life structure and the, I had a team looking after me. When that stopped, I felt lost and lonely. I didn't know anyone with a life like mine. In just a few months, I'd gone from 30-year-old PR professional ready to travel the world, 31-year-old bald cancer survivor who couldn't climb up the stairs without feeling exhausted. If my life were a book, I had all these blank pages ahead of me and I didn't know what to write next. And I was scared. I may have been the main character, but fear was the puppet master. And not just one fear, a whole squad, team fear, fear of recurrence, Fear of the flashbacks and the memories, fear of the future, so many different types of fears. Certainty helps us feel safe and secure. Our brains have developed and evolved to be good at recognizing patterns and building habits. Serious illnesses and events like the pandemic fill our lives with uncertainty and that can be very hard to tolerate. So if you have struggled, you're certainly not on your own. If ever you're feeling overwhelmed by the future, here are some book themed tips which have helped me. One, write one page at a time. The philosopher Jean-Paul Sartre said, we have to write our own meaning in the way we choose to live. I took a literal approach. I got a scrapbook and for the next year, filled the pages with days out, activities, pictures by my niece and photos. It gave me a focus and every, every completed page felt like progress and a step away from those traumatic times. Two, stop flipping to the last page. Nobody knows, nobody knows what the future holds. And while that can be unnerving, it can be wonderful too. I never dreamed I'd be here today speaking to you. <laughs> I think I'm mad for doing it, but <laughs> I never dreamed it. I have my own copywriting business now and I have wonderful friends and family. But when I find my mind racing to the what ifs of the future, I bring it back to the present. I focus on touch, so the feel of my clothes and the ground beneath my feet, and then I focus on my next step, and then the next, and then the next, and soon I start to feel better. Three, remember every protagonist has struggles. The perfect life does not exist, and it really doesn't make an interesting story either. Without the struggle to overcome, there is no story. And four, talk about your story and choose who to tell it to. 
When I finished my treatment, I had counseling sessions and mindfulness. Six years later, I had more counseling and I would definitely have it again in the future. Speaking to trained professionals helped me to process, understand and manage my emotions on a day-to-day -day basis. And writing this talk helped me too. Maybe one day in the future, you'll want to share your story and it will help others. So, depending on the stage of your life, your book may not be one you'd want to read. When you're in the middle of something painful or traumatic, it can be difficult to imagine happier times. Illness is hard. Surviving is hard. Life is hard. But if you're struggling now, it doesn't mean you're always going to struggle. Life is unpredictable and uncertain, but that brings with it exciting opportunities and possibilities. You're writing your story until the day you die. There are still blank pages left in your book. What are you going to write?